Hi there. In this video, I wanted to talk about two different ways in which we can get heteroscedastic errors. And the reason I want to talk about these two particular ways here is that depending on the type of heteroscedasticity which is coming about, there are basically two different ways in which we need to go ahead and tackle that problem. Okay, so let's just think about what the sort of normal problem is in econometrics. The idea is that there is some sort of population, P, and within that population P, there is some sort of population process, which defines a population error, U. And normally we think of this U as containing a sort of whole range of idiosyncratic factors, such that these idiosyncratic factors are uncorrelated with the other important independent variables in our population process, meaning that this sort of variable U has some sort of mean zero, and it has some sort of variance, let's say, sigma i squared, where I've sort of put a i such that we can say I'm not constricting or restricting this variance to be constant. It can vary with some of the explanatory factors. But the idea is that the um, mean of this particular error doesn't depend on the explanatory factors, so it's got a mean of zero. So that's, that's quite important. Um, and the idea is that we don't actually observe this population error U. We have to sort of come up with some sort of estimate of these sort of errors. And we do that by means of taking a sample from the population because generally we don't deal with the entirety of the population data. And then by estimating some sort of econometric model on that sample. So let's say we estimate some sort of model which is yi is equal to alpha plus beta 1 times x1i plus our sort of estimated u error, let's say u hat i. And we're using our sort of estimated errors u hat i because we don't actually observe our true alpha and beta 1. We have to estimate them. And in general, the estimates of them alpha hat and beta 1 hat won't exactly be equal to the true population parameters alpha and beta 1, let's say. And because of that, our population error ui won't in general be equal to our estimated error u hat i. So that's the difference between our error in our population and that which we estimate from our sample. So why am I bringing up this up now? Well, because of this distinction between the errors which we actually observe and the true errors, there are two different ways in which we can get heteroscedasticity occurring in our residuals. The first is if we actually have some degree of true heteroscedasticity. And then another word for sort of true in the way in which I'm using it here is what I'm going to call population heteroscedasticity. So the idea with population heteroscedasticity is that our true population error is in fact uh, heteroscedastic. So there is some sort of systematic variance in our population error squared, let's say u squared, along one of the important um, independent variables in our regression. So this might look something like this, um, whereby my errors squared are increasing along with an independent variable x1. This is an example of having population heteroscedasticity because I'm saying that this actual population error is increasing along with x1. And to sort of use a concrete example of this as one we've already covered, if I was to regress the percentage of income um, spent on food on an individual's level of income or a whole sort of range of different individuals' level of income rather, then we sort of hypothesize that there might be some sort of angle curve whereby people in general, when they're poorer, tend to spend a higher percentage of income on food. But as they get sort of richer, there is a sort of greater variance in terms of the ways in which people can spend their money on food. There are some people that don't really care about food at all and they don't really spend as a result that much as a percentage of their income on food but in absolute terms perhaps it's still more than those who are poorer, these sort of individuals here, but in sort of percentage terms it's not a particularly high amount. Whereas there are some people that absolutely love food, like this person here for example, and even though they earn a lot of money, they still spend a high percentage of their income on food. So they are sort of above average. And the idea here is that if we fit a straight line to this data, so we're just assuming that the only determinant of the percentage of income um, spent on food 
is an individual's level of income. I hope that you can see that as the level of income increases, the sort of average distance of the points away from the line tends to increase as well. And as a result of that, we have some sort of heteroscedasticity. But is this a result of heteroscedasticity in our population, or is this some sort of artifact in the way in which we've modelled the situation? Well, I mean, the distinction isn't as clear-cut as I've necessarily made it sound it is. The idea is that if we were to include some sort of third variable, which in this circumstance might be an individual's sort of taste for food, or in other words, do they really want to spend a lot of their money on food, do they really care about food, then perhaps if I included that third variable in our model, then our line, in, if we looked at it in two-dimensional space, would actually be a sort of curvy line, which would actually, once we've taken into account this sort of further factor, it would explain a lot of the variance in the percentage of income spent on food. But I'm actually still going to call this an example of population heteroscedasticity because of the fact that this third variable is unimportant. And by unimportant, I mean it's not correlated with my independent variables. It's not correlated with the variable of interest here. So it's not correlated with income. I don't know necessarily why you could sort of make an argument that as people get richer, they necessarily prefer to spend a higher percentage of their income on food. They necessarily have a sort of greater taste for food. I don't know how you could necessarily make that argument. So because of this sort of unassociation between um, income and sort of taste for food, then even though there is this third factor which is important in determining an individual's percentage of income spent on food, it's not important for our purposes. Uh, and our purpose here is to determine what's the effect of income on the percentage of income spent on food. But note that if this third factor wasn't actually uncorrelated with our variable of interest, then that would actually be a quite a serious situation. And we're going to talk about another example of where heteroscedasticity can occur, whereby our third variable isn't necessarily uncorrelated with our in other independent variables, in which case I'm going to call this model heteroscedasticity. This is sort of my definition of what I mean by model heteroscedasticity. It's not a term that I've seen anywhere else, just in case you go and sort of start to look up what this term means. So the idea here is, let's say I had some independent variable x1, and I'm using that to predict some dependent variable y. And I have a load of data points that look, let's say, something like, actually, let's make it something like this. So the idea that I've tried to sort of emphasize here is that if I sort of remove this final point here, which is sort of casting a bit of doubt over the situation, is that we have some sort of nonlinear relationship between y and x1, which if we just go ahead and we just fit a straight line to this data, it will not capture the situation very well. And in fact, we will have some degree of heteroscedasticity because as x1 increases, my errors are going to get bigger and bigger. And when x1 is quite small, my sort of errors aren't actually that far uh, away from the line, or my, my points aren't that far away from the line, rather. So I'm going to have some sort of degree of heteroscedasticity, which tests like the Broich Pagan test will pick up. Okay, why is this different to the circumstance of percentage of income spent on food against income? Well, the idea here is that our true population model might be something like y is equal to alpha plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x1 squared. Yeah, so that's our sort of true population process, which defines our population error u. And because of the fact that we've tried to do away, we, we sort of forgot to include rather this x1 squared term, so we've omitted an important variable, and um, that means that our OLS estimates are essentially going to be biased. And we can see that because essentially we're trying to fit a straight line to something which is essentially non-linear, so it's, we should intuitively know that, that that's wrong. And if we were to include this sort of x1 squared term, then actually what we'd probably have is we would actually find out that we actually had homoscedastic errors because 
we would fit this sort of curvy line to our data. And this is really important in this circumstance that this isn't necessarily, just because originally we found that we had heteroscedasticity is not indicative of the fact that we have heteroscedasticity in our population because once we included a third sort of important factor, then we have removed this heteroscedasticity. And this third important factor, because x1 and x1 squared are definitely related to one another, they're an increasing, uh, there's an increasing sort of correlation between the two of them, then we know that the OLS estimates of beta 1 are actually going to be incorrect. So in this particular circumstance, it's really, really important that we don't just take the observation that we have heteroscedasticity to mean that we have true population heteroscedasticity. It's more of a sign that if we find we have heteroscedasticity in our model, that we're more than likely to be excluding an important omitted variable. And by important, I mean that it is correlated with one of our independent variables, meaning that our OLS estimates are going to be biased. So the idea with heteroscedasticity is that whenever we find it in our model, we firstly assume that we have model heteroscedasticity because it's more than likely that we've misspecified our model either by forgetting to include some important third factor or by sort of using x1 when in fact we should have been using LUN x1, for example. So there's some sort of functional problem. And only after we've played around with our model, uh, of course, within the realms of the sort of economic situation which we're talking about, um, only after we've exhausted all other potential sources of this heteroscedasticity might we then start to think that we've actually got some sort of true population heteroscedasticity. So only then do we really want to be sort of dealing with this particular type of heteroscedasticity because there are methods for dealing with population heteroscedasticity. So in the next video, we're going to talk about these methods for dealing with this um, population heteroscedasticity after we've sort of exhausted all the other possible causes which could have come about um, for this heteroscedasticity, which came about as imperfections in our modelling, or due to imperfections in our modelling rather.